we live in unusual times as our university has turned into a virtual space where we interact only thanks to the miracles of modern technology. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, our freedom is clearly restricted by national laws and regulations, which don't give us access to the Queen Mary campus, but at least give us food for thought to reconsider the global role of international law, or perhaps lack thereof. Still, as the old Persian adage made famous by Abraham Lincoln tells us, this too shall pass. And when it passes, we shall return to the world of cross-border trade and freer flow of people. This post-pandemic world might not be one of neoliberal globalization as we once knew it. There are already too many signs that the descendants of the Western originators of this trend are shifting their concerns from global governance to local issues. This post-pandemic world might also not be one of rising national nationalism and protectionism either. For there are social forces that demand cross-border engagement, and they're backed by the free spirit of hundreds of millions who seek to either travel or trade internationally on a daily basis. Now, the title of my talk today implicitly concerns the future, and I need to preface it by telling you that if there is any certainty that we know of, it was already summarized by Kurt Vonnegut when he wrote that history is merely a list of surprises, as it can only prepare us to be surprised yet again. But I'll take my chances in this talk. I'll argue that changes in major trends that underpin the structures of international law are reflections and perhaps simultaneously causes of a long-term global process. Now this process is a shift from global to regional authority, where global norms intertwine with regional agreements and courts. By this point, I hope that you already have a vague idea why I chose the first half of my title. Now the second half, international law and the decentralization of world order will be an ongoing and largely implicit theme throughout the talk. So I won't refer back to it explicitly until the very end, but it's still very important to keep in mind. My argument today is a perfect example of dialectics as the centuries old universalization of normative legal practices meets an emerging demand for regional solutions to cross-border problems within a number of areas. In the first part of my talk, I'll focus on the international system and the way it relates to international law, so this will be a theoretical part. In the second part, I'll cover the regionalization of international public law and in the third part, I'll cover the regionalization of international private law. Finally, I'll reiterate my core argument. In the process, I'll aim to demonstrate that the two forces driving the tectonic shifts towards the regionalization of international law are primarily structural and material. So let's begin with the international system and its relationship to international law. Now, a good starting point for this is the quote-unquote international, because its competing conceptualizations reveal fundamental challenges to the establishment of a comprehensive global legal system. International relations, or simply IR, as a discipline, has produced various debates on the characteristics of the international system. And understanding them sheds light on the challenges faced by international law. 
There are three main competing conceptualizations of the quote-unquote international. Anarchy, hierarchy, and international society. Now, the first conceptualization of the international system that I'll introduce to you is anarchy. And it is considered to be mainstream. The way that the term anarchy is used here differs from the general use of the word. So when IR scholars talk about anarchy, what they mean is that there is no overarching authority in the international system. That there is no 911, no police force, no hospital, no fire brigade that a government can report its problems to. This stems from the fact that each state has ownership of its sovereignty. Ship of its sovereignty. So any disputes would mean that one sovereignty is juxtaposed against another. So state commitments to international law are and can only be voluntary. This always holds true for international agreements and is also the case in customary international law is there is no enforcement mechanism that threatens those who choose not to comply. Now, the underlying reason for all of this is, as we mentioned earlier, anarchy. The second conceptualization of the international system is hierarchy, and it is often adopted by critical scholars. Some of them view hierarchy in opposition to anarchy. But there is clearly evidence in support of both camps. So, in my view, this clearly suggests that these are two different dimensions of the international system. Now, hierarchy is broadly understood as a system of relations underpinned by super and subordination, where some states can at times suppress others, coerce them to act against their will, or just take liberty in terms of disregarding international agreements and suffer no or little consequences for their actions. So, in other words, this conceptualization of the international system is a reflection of the imbalance of power between the strong and the weak. At the global level, this means that great powers whether they be the United States, China, Russia, or any other emerging powers or political unions, can opt in and opt out of international agreements more or less as they wish. Similarly, great powers can choose to accept or reject the adjudication of international courts as it suits them. And it is important to understand that this is, this is not as some scholars have recently suggested, specific only to states with certain political systems. It is instead a systemic feature of international relations which delimits the powers of international law. Now, the third concept I'll introduce to you suggests that the quote-unquote international has evolved beyond a system and into a society. Hence, this concept is termed international society. And today, it is most closely associated with the English school. As lawyers, you might be delighted to know that the concept of international society can be traced back to Hugo Grotius. It is rooted in the classical legal tradition and in the notion that international society constitutes a community of those participating in the international legal order. So this means that international society refers to a group of states which interact with one another and are bound by a set of rules and norms because they have a common interest in maintaining these arrangements. This idea therefore suggests that the quote-unquote international is more than a system and that it is instead a society, an arrangement 
of a higher order than a system. So from this perspective, you might argue that we live in a world with 195 coexisting states, which need to get along much like 195 neighboring people or 195 neighboring communities. So to solve their disagreements, they will abide by international law. But of course, international society is not the same as British, French, or Japanese society, as we do not have global parliaments and enforcement mechanisms. Besides, historical and cultural differences at the global level far outweigh those at the national one, even if you consider large states. So, when discussing international society, it is important not to turn a blind eye to its limitations. Now combining these three, now combining these three conceptualizations of the international, we can see that although its social aspect is conducive to cooperation under international law, this is limited by the effects of anarchy and hierarchy. So anarchy prevents us from establishing an overarching authority to resolve disputes or enforce regulations, while hierarchy demonstrates that existing agreements and the extent to which they are complied with might not always be an accurate reflection of what conscientious lawyers understand as justice. Now, it is common for academics to frame debates over international law as the global versus the national. The global view uh, holds an aspiration for universal principles, and it is typical for the idealists. For those who continue to follow in the footsteps of their predecessors that attended the Hague Conference in 1899 and 1907, and perhaps believe that if only they can get the law right, this can replace war with peaceful international adjudication forever. Now the latter group, the cynics, are often also labeled realists. And they argue that states will always act in their national interest, that it has always been and it will always be like that. And some of them are even inclined to think that this is how it should be. But here's the problem with this dichotomy. If you trap yourselves between the two sides of this debate, you risk becoming no more than perhaps hopeful dreamers or disappointed cynics. Or perhaps one or two of you might even give up on law and turn into realists. But there are many issues where states can act in their national interest and simultaneously share their interests. Remember that one of the core interests of each state is to gain recognition from other states. For sovereignty has both internal and external aspects. So there must be a third way. And this requires sobering up and giving up on ideational purity, just because the social world is messy. So this brings me to a very important question. Where are we most likely to find this third way of enhanced international law applied in practice? Now, let's turn back to the theoretical framework that we have established so far. It demonstrated how anarchy, hierarchy, and international society sketch the outline which delimits the extent to which international law impacts international politics. What this theoretical framework tells us is that where international politics exhibits stronger features of anarchy and hierarchy, international law is less relevant. And where it exhibits stronger features of international society, international law becomes more relevant. So 
how does this translate into practice? Well, let's turn to the regionalization of international public law now. Many philosophers of history, such as uh, George Santayana, have argued that to know the future, we must know our past. And here, I would add that this also holds true for those who seek to know the present. So, I'll touch briefly on the past 70 years of history, which have led to the unprecedented expansion of international law. It's hard to talk about international law without talking about Europe, as it is on the old continent of all parts of the world, where international law has taken central stage and it's at the regional level. This process developed alongside regional integration, alongside regional integration, which reinforced the free movement of people and the free exchange of goods and services within the European Union, both a system and a structure which has engulfed much of the region. There is a general consensus among academics that European integration practices and legal regulations set the global standard of what is considered best practices from a legal perspective. So because of this, it is often the case that Latin American, African or Southeast Asian integration are seen as somewhat flawed, dysfunctional or even failing. But this is only the case if you compare them to the EU. Now, if you view non-European regions on their own, the landscape becomes much more optimistic. So, to give you a brief overview, I'll draw examples from a number of regions, starting with Latin America. From the perspective of international conflict or war, Latin America is among the most peaceful regions in the world. And this dates back at least to the beginning of the 20th century, um, when the South American Anti-War Treaty of Non-Aggression and Conciliation was adopted during the Chaco War. And uh, it managed to help with the territorial dispute between Bolivia and Paraguay. This was originally conceived and implemented as a South American war, Anti-War Treaty and in recognition of his contribution to its conception, Argentine Foreign Minister Salvandra Lamas ultimately re received the Nobel Prize in 1936. After World War II, a number of regional treaties and organizations emerged in Latin America, and they formed what some have termed, quote unquote, an alphabet soup of various coexisting overlapping and sometimes even competing blocks. When these blocks have not been defined by political ideology, they serve as vehicles to facilitate regional or sub-regional trade agreements or bilateral agreements with some uh, sub-regional blocks as a signatory. Uh, to give you an example, Brazil has signed onto nine multilateral trade agreements, including two sub-regional ones, Mercosur and the Latin American integration system, and two which involve a vast number of developing countries, both within and outside of Latin America. Other notable sub-regional agreements include the Andean community, the Central American common market, and the Caribbean community. Now, let's turn also to Africa, where a number of regional organizations coexist as well. Today, the African Union gets the most attention in terms of international scholarship, but there are many sub-regional organizations which produced functional agreements decades ago. For instance, the Economic Community of Central Africa shares a common currency, and the East African Community has been using um, uh, regional passports, they've been issuing them since 1999. Now, most recently, 
the African Continental Free Trade Agreement was signed and uh, supposed to enter into force last year in May. It's expected to aid the free movement of goods, services, and people across Africa. So we hope that it will lead to the removal of both tariff and non-tariff barriers. Now, this was preceded by an initiative to establish an African single passport. And that was announced four years ago in 2016. Now, this is currently in progress. And then there's also the single African air transport market agreement. So this should promote a unified, so this should promote a unified air transport market and liberalize civil aviation in Africa. Now, another region, Southeast Asia, has united around the, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, otherwise known as ASEAN. This region is home to 204 million Muslims, 130 million Christians, 140 million Buddhists, and 7 million Hindus. So this makes around 200 million more people than the EU. And many of these people in ASEAN differ a lot in terms of cultural background, both within and between states. Now, meanwhile, ASEAN has a budget over 10 times smaller than that of the EU. And it has been relentlessly progressing despite of that. So it's achieved regional consensus on many occasions and added many regional treaties since its inception in 1967. The success of ASEAN was so unlikely and so unexpected that Kishore Mahbubani, the famous scholar, called for a Nobel Peace Prize to be awarded to the organization around three or four years ago. But unfortunately, a lot of the achievements of ASEAN have been swept under the rug for decades, and so was this call. Now, there are, of course, skeptics um, who would put forth a number of criticisms to my points. So, Latin American organizations have not been seen as particularly cost-effective, and some believe that they remain resilient primarily due to promoting the personal interests of politicians and bureaucrats within the region. Africa, as you've most likely uh, heard yourselves, is uh, routinely labeled hopeless or doomed by experts who simultaneously sometimes enjoy the comfort of their corporate or academic offices in New York or London. Southeast Asia has attracted a number of uh, um, skeptical commentaries from those who doubt that ASEAN is nearly as triumphant as its statements suggest. And perhaps to your surprise here, I would not completely dismiss these statements. But what I would tell you is that you cannot use Europe as a benchmark to judge the success or failure of other regional agreements. Because non-European regions are made up of younger states, and uh, these younger states have different uh, histories, different cultural backgrounds, smaller budgets, diverse interests. And on top of this, Europe has been the cradle of legal innovation um, since the Roman Empire. So instead of taking on board conclusions made in the corporate or academic offices of New York or London, which I mentioned earlier, I ask you to consider comparing the development levels of regional agreements in Latin America, Africa, or Southeast Asia today to what they were 70 years ago. There were states in some of these regions that had not yet gained their independence in 1950. And today they're signing international agreements which call for shared control over airspace and common regional passports. So from this perspective, the expansion of uh, international regional law has been truly remarkable. Now, this is not to say that we have not made progress at the global level. 
for instance, in the WTO or in the UN, but the structural conditions in regions and the, the strong effects of a sense of, of, of regional society and the weaker effects of anarchy and hierarchy mean that there is tremendous potential for the expansion of regional public law. Now, let me turn to regional private law. Turn to regional private law, which, similar to regional public law, has expanded rapidly over the past decades. Uh, this forms part of a general global expansion of law, which has been driven by two trends. So, first, legal regulations are becoming a more widely accepted method of resolving disputes and regulating various industries. Um, in the academic literature, you'll often see terms such as norm diffusion across international organizations or norm cascade, which refers to the adoption of certain norms domestically due to international pressure. And you'll also see frequent references to scholars such as Fenmore and Sicking. For you, as lawyers, it is certainly important to read up on these arguments. But my point here is much broader, as I'm not claiming that certain states or certain regions necessarily have to adopt specific norms which have been diffused or which have cascaded from external sources. Instead, what I view as a fundamental factor here is the near universal adoption of legal systems and I mean a plurality of systems, which despite their differences, still uphold the norm of promoting international law. So in this sense, the first trend that I'm concerned with is the globalization of law as a method for regulating activity or resolving disputes. Now, the second trend that I'm concerned with is the increase in demand for such legal services at the regional level. This is fundamentally underpinned by the expansion or the development of the material environment that we have built and rebuilt in the past decades. And evidence for this is uh, something that seems obvious to me, but is, I think, overlooked way too often in academic discourse. So we have, first of all, way more people than before. As the global population has grown from around 2.5 billion to over 7 billion in the past seven decades. Meanwhile, our technology has developed at an exponentially increasing speed. So more and more modern technology and more and more people mean more material goods and more services. Now, in the context of business becoming increasingly institutionalized and formalized, this means less informal and more formal business relations, more registered companies and more trade. And across borders, this means more disputes and more demand for international private law. So let's turn to the potential solutions to commercial disputes which might arise. The parties generally have two options. Either to take the diplomatic route and rely on negotiation, mediation, or conciliation by a third party or to resort to legal choices, which include arbitration and adjudication. Now, arbitration takes place when the two parties voluntarily specify the arbiter in their commercial contracts. And this allows them to avail themselves of the permanent court of arbitration and uh, choose instead uh, an international chamber of commerce or a regional arbitration center as an arbiter. And then adjudication takes place when the legal bodies can and do proceed with or without the assent of the defendant. Now, let's zoom in on the structures which allow arbitration and see how they have changed. 
A hundred years ago, the global centers for resolving investment in commercial disputes were European. And they included the Permanent Court of Arbitration, um, Sweden's uh, Arbitration Institute, and the Inter Arbitration Institute, and the International Chamber of Commerce. Well, today, there are plenty of alternatives. So, if you think about Asia alone, uh, there are alternatives in Hong Kong, um, Singapore, Tokyo, uh, Beijing, and of course across the world there are alternatives in many other places. Now, let's turn to international courts. During the Cold War, until the 1990s, they generally aimed to have a broader scope. But recently, adjudication has become much more regional. So, on this slide, for instance, uh, you can see a brief table that gives you a comparative perspective of international economic courts serving Europe, Latin America, and Africa. But this is again just an example of a broader trend. And as the dates here indicate, most of these regional courts were established in the past two or three decades. And there are many reasons for this. So from a political science perspective, there is a multi and diversity of interests and preferences among, between, and even within states and regions. So in this sense, regional courts can sometimes have complementary rather than competing roles. So for instance, the Andean Tribunal of Justice often handles disagreements over the registration of trademarks um, and patents. The East African Court of Justice is usually avoided by human rights groups, but businesses use it actively to resolve their disputes. The point here is that even though some scholars implicitly assume or simply um, suggest in their work that international or regional courts are similar or more or less the same, in reality, this does not appear to be the case. So in practice, these courts seem to have um, sometimes distinct and complementary roles. Now, another reason why regional courts coexist could be the fact that newer agreements are simply more judicialized than previous ones. And this drives the demand for these courts. Now, this is a difficult topic to research since one can hardly obtain large scale data on private agreements. However, some recent research has uh, suggested that there is considerable evidence for this argument. In addition to that, uh, governments and people around the world have long complained that US and European actors have way too much power, so regional courts can serve as a legal alternative. At the regional level, also the creation of a court is seen as a sign of commitments to integration by a certain um, association of institution. And it is often in the interest of governments to signal or at least publicly display a commitment to deepening regional integration projects, even though sometimes they do not intend to follow up on this immediately. Now, in terms of allowing private citizens to access the benefits of this integration process, regional courts uh, and centers for dispute resolution allow private access to their services. Some scholars have rightly called regional permanent coal, uh, courts a uh, quote unquote new style courts. And this denotes that adjudication there is compulsory and that non-state actors can initiate litigation. Um, finally, it is important that despite the regionalization of international law, protections for state sovereignty are still available. So, of course, the simplest path to that is um, in the form of conditionally binding rules or by allowing opt-outs or derogations from um, uh, the rules or from the institutions of dispute settlement. Uh, 
um, while other options such as um, state, while other options such as um, state-controlled intervention in terms of access to regional courts also exist. This is especially important when you consider non-European contexts. As many states there are much younger and less integrated than those of the European Union. So in this sense, there is a need to emphasize the fact that regional courts and centers for dispute resolution are not there to replace states, but to, to, to either complement them or at least make sure not to seriously undermine their interests. So in this sense, I encourage you to consider the reality that although states can find themselves in trouble with the law sometimes, these are often two different sides of the same coin rather than two sides in opposition. So whether regional courts continue to be appealing enough to both states and private actors will be an important indicator of whether they are likely to continue to thrive. So this brings me to my conclusion which I need to preface by pointing out that uh, some of you are coming to study international public law specifically or international private law specifically. And this is why I intentionally separated um, the two in two distinct sections of my talk uh, so far. But to flesh out my broader argument, I need to break the boundaries between the two and in doing so, I will reorder some of the points that I made earlier in the talk. So, in short, what I argue for is that we now live in a world of the globalization of law as a method and the regionalization of law as practice. So, first, this starts with the adoption of agreements or regulations as a principle or method in various parts of the world. Second, structural factors kick in. So, because the effect of anarchy and hierarchy is smaller and the sense of international society is stronger within regions, they build institutional structures which accelerate their integration. Third, material factors are added on. With the recent increase in population, of production, trade, services, there is much greater demand for legal solutions, further fueling the expansion of law, particularly at the regional level, where cross-border engagement is traditionally frequent. And finally, what this results into is global norms in regional courts, which ultimately fuels the decentralization of international law and hence of world order. Now before I finish off, there are two more points that I'd like to leave you with. At the theoretical level, I encourage you to engage with the regionalization of international law and would be of course glad to hear to what extent you agree or disagree with my argument. And at the practical level, as young professionals, it might be wise of you to keep track of the regionalization of international law. Not simply because of the degree to which it shapes cross-border interactions today, but also because of the potential it has to do so for the future. Thank you very much for listening. Stay safe. And uh, I hope that you can soon come over and continue your legal studies in person at Queen Mary.